So good morning, everybody. So this is a brief assessment. MQB 7035, Occupational Health. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, Ricardo Landry from University of uh, Torino. So good morning again. I'm Professor Dr. Victor Ho uh, from Department of Social Security Medicine, Faculty Medicine in Malaya, um, the, current, the current head of the department. So today, class basically we discuss on what is risk, all right? And then we look at how do, how do we assess risk? And then we look at quantitative versus qualitative risk assessment. Sorry, qualitative versus quantitative risk assessment. Managing or transferring risk. So why do we do? Why do we need to learn about risk assessment? Why is so important about doing risk assessment? I think before before the COVID nineteen, a lot of people don't understand that risk assessment basically forms the basis of of us making decision. Of course, we're talking about risk assessment. Of course, we do risk assessment at all the time. But we talk, when we talk about risk assessment, so why why do you do you do you think we need to learn about risk assessment? I'm fine. To avoid hazard. Avoid hazard. All right, great. Need to identify hazard. Yeah, to uh, perhaps to identify also about uh, who may be at uh, risk, higher risk, lower risk, uh, location wise. Um, environment wise. All right, very good. So, so basically, to identify all those things. Anything else? To decide, to decide which one uh, to give priority. To, par to prioritize, prioritize action. All right. Yes. Anything else? To manage the risk. Or control the risk. To manage the risk. All right. Because we uh, we want to prevent risk. Okay, so that we can prevent risk. Okay, so very good. I think I think all of you understand why we need to do risk assessment. All right, and then 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 the, the next step is what is risk assessment and what is risk and how how do we move forward? All right, let's let's go, let's let's carry on with the class. All right. So how do you conduct risk assessment? Anyone here who can tell me how do you conduct risk assessment? Sorry. High high rate. High rate. All right. What's high rate? Please, can, can you please uh, explain people who are part of the word high rate? Risk assessment and risk uh, control. Okay, so it's hazard identification, risk assessment and risk control. Very good. Anything else? Uh, CHRE, including assessment and risk control. All right. Risk assessment. All right. Analysis. Job safety analysis. Okay, basically the one you learn learn that day job safety analysis. All right, all those people who, who have went, went for the HRA class will basically know what is happening. But how do you how do you conduct it? Those are those are methods that you do to conduct conducting a risk assessment. But then we, we focus on at the end of the day what what is the best method for you to use and how what actually what 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 actually benefit. All right, the population. So what is risk? Let's start with, all right? Of course, we know that there are different types of risk. As I, I think someone who have attended HRA will basically understand what is the different type of risk that we're talking about, all right? So those are the different type of risks that you basically are going to uh, encounter, all right? Of course, this is a uh, Bayes theorem, all right? This is basically statistic, all right? All right, statistic you will learn Bayes theorem with basically the, the, the simple simple thing is that when you talk, when you when you assess a risk, it's not based on MP information. It's based on what you know now, and then you have a risk. Then after that, tomorrow you know more, your risk change. Tomorrow you know more, the risk change. That's why people say, why do we always change our SOP, our standard operating procedure, our advice? In the time of COVID-19, which is two years long, all right. Why do we change the time? Because we have in changed the information changes, the perception changes, the issue, the idea changes. Why do we? Why does the British all take so long to actually actually change their their, their risk? Is this because it is because they is it because of what is what is the implication of changing the changing the advice? When you change your advice, what will happen? All right, that is what is what you need to understand. All right, 
So risk, there's always a probability is based on prior knowledge. All right. So there's always a prior knowledge, and that's why risk changes. Risk advice changes. Don't don't you don't decide that okay today I will I will say this I, com I continue to say this. Risk advice changes. Risk perception changes. And there's a lot of people get very very uh, upset when they, when something 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 bad happened and say oh why you did not decide it earlier. We did not decide this earlier. It's not because that we don't know there's a risk, but there's always a balance between risk and how you actually conduct your, your activity. I can have, I can basically advise to have a zero risk or near zero risk situation, all right? Especially in COVID. Because I said everybody must wear full PPE, everybody must be, must be fully gowned for everything they do. So that there are risks risk involved in anything we do. It is basically related to decision making. So the idea of doing risk assessment is for you to make, for you to be able to make decision, decision on what you want to do and how you want to do it, and whether you want you want to you want to take the risk or not is up to you. But the, it, is, it is it is basically a form of making decision. You don't go around thinking that you can live in a risk-free environment and you can basically perform doing things without without getting. Uh, without thinking of risk itself, so risk is often risk of risk often not objective but subjective. All right, so it's actually sometimes it's not objective in the sense that you make the decision not based on information available, not based on facts, not based on evidence, not based on uh, the assessment, but it's based on your own attitude or your own ap appetite or your own or, or your own own cultural belief that you make the decision on. Whether you take the risk or not. So risk attitude or risk appetite is something that something that is different from what we call uh, when the risk that we're discussing today. But the, we do have that risk attitude and risk appetite, which I want to uh, the short time discuss with you further. So the main thing is risk can never be avoided. You can never avoid risk, but you can actually manage the risk. There is risk, but you can say that okay, I don't want to do that. But the problem is you avoiding this, you basically you are taking risk doing another activity. That's just like just like vaccine itself. Why why people take vaccine? Why people don't take vaccine? Because people that don't take vaccine have a separate perception of risk, and people who take vaccine have a separate perception of risk. So which is which is basically is it's not is not that one that one have no risk. Both there is risk, but basically different people have different perception of risk. But the problem, the, the idea is, why do we, why do we insist that people must make the make decision based on what we tell them to do? Why can't people make their own decision on what is the risk? So that is another discussion that maybe maybe we can decide later. So it, risk must be managed. The the main take home message is there's no situation with zero risk. That's the only thing you need to understand. There's no situation with zero risk. Why is it important? Because this is important when you want to communicate with people. You want to talk to people. People will come and tell you. People will come and ask you to make the decision. You cannot make the decision for them. You can only tell them these are the risks. You make your own decision. Correct. You make your own decision whether you want to do it or not. So the idea is how do you make sure that they make the correct decision? Is to ensure that you educate them and inform them and tell them of each of the Risk for each of the situation that they, the the student, the, sorry, the your patient or your um, or people that consult you are going to take. So the the first thing is there's no zero risk. Some people always want to want to have zero risk, zero risk of getting COVID, zero risk of doing something. But there is no zero risk. There's no there's always a risk, however small, however minute is there. So that is the thing that you need to remember. So people who argue that we need we cannot have any risk. There's no such thing. So when you wake up this morning, you have already conducted your own risk assessment, all right? People who online, okay, decided not to come to class. Why you decide not to come to class? Because you have done your own risk assessment. You've done your own assessment. You've done your own assessment. The risk is not just about health risk, all right? It's about what, what, what is, what if I don't come to class, what am I missing? I'm missing Prof. Victor sitting in front of me, but I can, I can still see you in the camera, correct? You can still see me here. So what am I missing? So you make your own risk already, correct? You make your own risk assessment, 
When you wake up, why did you come to class this morning? Why did you sit, why you come and sit here? Why can't you just sit in, sit online? Want to see me live? But what's what is so special about seeing me live? <laughs> Correct. What 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 can you learn online that you can learn here? It's not about seeing me. It's about more about locate seeing each other, communicate with each other. Must it's more about human getting being human, communicating with each other. You come to class not because of me. You come to class because of you. The more people come to class, the more people, the, it will basically compound that the more people will come to class because that that communication, that connection actually makes us human. That's why we come to class. All right. You're sitting back there, although 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 you think that you are communicating with me, but actually actually it's very difficult for me to communicate, especially if you communicate with your friend. Okay, so why did you come to class this morning? This morning you make the risk assessment, correct? Right? So what 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 do you make? Do I come to class or do I not come to class? Do I cross the road or do I not cross the road? So what is the risk of going to this market? So what is the risk? So am I going to start in traffic or not going to start in traffic? So you make your own decision, you make your own uh, assumption. So when when do I come to class? At what time? All right, I come to class at uh, seven o'clock because it will cut the traffic. I will have a parking space, or I come to class at uh, eight forty-seven because because uh, I will also cut the traffic. All right, and I know that I know that what what I what I miss earlier from uh, eight thirty to eight forty-seven uh, not is not is not going to be missed. All right, good. Good morning. Welcome to Occupational Health. Can you uh, tell me what's the name again? Freddy. Freddy? Freddy. Freddy. Hi, Freddy. Good morning. So Freddy just came to class. So he made the decision to come to class late. So he made the risk decision early in the morning. He did his risk assessment. He said, I will come to class late today. And I will arrive at 8.47. Right? That's the decision he made. No problem. I agree. I don't, I don't care about the decision. It's your decision. You, you decide. But you have made the risk assessment, you have made the assessment of why you come to class. So that is the thing, all right? So let's look at this road traffic accident rate. So do you drive or not? Look at the rate. Malaysia is the third. We are always we are always the top for, for the wrong reason. Eh? All right? <laughs> because because even after after so many years of uh, independence. We, are, we, are, we, are, we still have the notion that, that uh, we are not independent, that someone is still coming after us. So we don't, we, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't allow our citizens to actually uh, do what they want or prosper or think freely. All right. So the idea is, OK, so that's what we do. So do you come to class or not? Do you drive or not? Or do you stay at home are you, as you are? You stay at home because you know that you're not going to ignore an accident. And, and that's what happened. All right. So. When, when do you do it and when do you do it? So there are perceptions that you, you get because you have information. So you have information, you have information available to you. So do I go for air travel or do I go for or, uh, motor vehicle? Uh, do I drive? Do I drive or do I fly? Which is more which is safer now? But but the problem is once an aeroplane crash, everybody stops flying because everybody thinks the aeroplane are. Dangerous, but every day accident happen, and you should continue to drive. So why 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 do we make different decisions? Although the information is almost the same, why do we make different decisions? Because this decision is based on what are the what what we are expecting out of the decision that we make. Some of the decision can be avoided. Some of the some of the activities can be avoided, and that's why we avoid those activity and we make another decision for doing another activity. So do you, is it safer to drive to uh, Penang or to fly to Penang? So based on this information, I want to drive to Penang or to fly to Penang? Yeah. It's safer to fly. Yeah. Right? Of course, if, if, I, if, I, if I fly, I cannot have a no car, so I cannot go around. So those are the decisions that you make. So I think this one has been explained earlier, All right, but no, no problem, we repeat it again. So there are basically, when you, when you work from an organization, when you come to University of Malaya, all right, we have our own risk perception. We have our own risk idea. We basically will tell you, if you're not vaccinated, you cannot come in. That's our decision. You cannot dispute our decision. You cannot say it's human right. It's human right for you to not to, to not to have vaccine. But it's also our right, organization right, to have our own policy. 
And if my policy does not does is not is not contributing to the, the human rights that you have or the or the activity that you have, then it's our active our policy. If you don't like our policy, you can basically go to another university to have a different policy. You can work from another other organization with different policies. But you can actually look at it from different perspectives, like personal risk and organization risk. These two individuals are doing the same thing. Is it correct? But two individuals take take the risk differently and 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 the safety precaution, safety procedure are taken differently. What is what is the risk are the same. All right. If he fall, he dies. The risk of falling is dead. But because each of them are both of them are doing things for, for different purpose. One is occupational uh, window cleaner. One is basically rock climbing. So it's another it's another risk basically. But the risks are almost the same. They are actually the same people. What do you mean they are the same people? There are only people who have that kind of perception, that kind of attitude, that kind of risk attitude, who actually work as a window cleaner. You cannot get window cleaner. You cannot get you and me sitting down here and want to clean window, although it pays more than the doctor sometimes. But you don't do it because you don't. And it's not. And for us, then they don't like to sit inside the office. They like to work in outdoor. And that's what they. That's why they do it. So the, those are the same people, the same perception. But you must understand when you when you look at risk, you must tell them that yes, you are high risk people. But during work, you need to follow procedure. So that is the that's the communication issue that you need to need to basically ensure that it happens. Because the problem is when you hire people who is high risk, especially when you talk about other kind of risk. This is this is the same thing. This is basically a voluntary risk and an involuntary risk. You voluntarily you voluntarily go for to play game on the computer and you join gaming and you play for for uh, 24 hours, 32 hours, 48 hours nonstop, but it's, it's uh, involuntary that you come, you need to risk when you come to work. Although it's, it's still considered voluntary in the sense that you come to work because you voluntarily come to work, but but you come to work, but you, you don't want to take the risk. And you and as I as an organization, I as the, the safety and health of this organization, I need to ensure that there's no risk or minimum risk for your kind of activity. But the other one is basically you voluntarily take it. You basically use it because you know that you understand the same thing about what we discussed just now. Of the organization and personal risk. Of course, we have different kind of risks also. We have what we call pure risk, which is what we call safety risk. Safety risk is always a pure risk. In the sense that there's no benefit of taking the risk. There's no benefit in taking the risk. But there are basically speculative risks, correct? Speculative risk consists of benefit and harm. You can have benefit or harm, but basically by taking the risk, you can have benefit also. Because you have something called speculative. That's why. That's why when you when you when you get people who have, who have different risk perception, different risk taking behavior, and then you you bring them into an organization, you must be able to tell them that my organization, this is our risk uh, attitude. This is our risk appetite, and this is what you need to follow. So that's why it's, it's, it's very difficult when you talk about why is it so difficult to tell people, okay, to to uh, ensure that they don't take risks. This is because different people have different risk perception, different people have different risk attitude, and that's why you need to understand how do you actually explain that to them. All right, explanation or communication of risk is important. Why we need to take the certain precaution to actually reduce risk in our organization, especially safety and health risk, is important. And is that is that operational? Or not? Can it be done or not? Do you want to do it or not? You don't want to do it. That's why it cannot be done if you don't want to do it. That's why there's no such thing as sometimes you get but oh because people people some people are not following some people are what yes that's why you need to have some safety net some safe, some 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 way to actually communicate some people to understand some people to identify some people to give advice all right because we know that. You cannot continually, continually in this uh, high risk situation for a long period of time because you can, uh, your your brain actually cannot survive this situation. So risk evaluation is always an ongoing process. It is continually happening, continually being 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 perceived. That's why you need to teach people how to do this assessment. You need to teach your teach your staff how to do this assessment because you want them to do, you want them to think 
an activity before you do research. You get you, you start by teaching your child to decide what is safe, what is not safe. Your child will decide, and then basically then they will basically move on and they will they will be able to do their work. So without 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 basically you telling them what to do, they basically they have a risk perception of what is risky and what's not risky. This is I will go through this very fast. So sometimes it's something called unknown risk when you don't know the risk yet. So what, what are you going to do? So let's say although 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 there is okay, there is a perception that RNA RNA technology currently being used for COVID-19 vaccine. What's the risk? You don't know, correct? You won't know, correct? When we when we introduce asbestos, when we start to use asbestos in a large large uh, process, when we do it, we did not know the risk of asbestos. All right, so it's still unknown because although we have models that actually can can predict, we have we have information that they can do, but the risk itself, you tell, you ask me, you ask me, do I know the risk? I have said many times, I don't know the risk. And you must agree, you must be able to say, I don't know in that. Because the risk is not known. This is basically genetic engineering technique, correct? RNA vaccination is a genetic engineering technique where you basically you, you create an RNA, right? The RNA essentially is, is not, you create an RNA and you introduce the RNA into a body. It's genetic engineering. Are we, are we going to die soon? Maybe. Until everybody dies, correct? <laughs> That's the only thing we know. Once you are born, you're going to die, correct? Once you're born, you're going to grow old. You cannot, you cannot stop time. That's, that's the thing, correct? But it's the issue is when, you, when are you going to die? Whether you're going to die a peaceful death or you're going to die suffering from a disease, correct? Okay, conceal or un unconscious risk. That is the, that's the, that is the, that is the, what we call problem that we face. A lot of the time, people don't know the risk, people don't understand the risk. So people continue to work, continue to do things, continue to uh, basically uh, fraud the SOP that we actually advise them that, that they continue to do it because they have, they don't understand. They think that because I wear a, a mask, I wear, I wear a mask itself, surgical mask, or I wear N95, I'm safe completely but the idea is that you are not safe because there are risks and it is as a lot of people understand a lot of the things that we discuss all the time is it's not one layer of protection it's multi -layer, multiple layer of protection each layer doing different work and that's why there is a con combining the multiple layer of protection we have a good protection but it's not 100 percent also then cautious, conscious, cautious risk when people actually know the risk, but they take the risk. There's no problem with that, especially they talk about uh, personal risk factor. Like I know that by rock climbing, I know that if I miss one finger, I will fall and I will die. I know that. I know that if I ride my bike very quickly, if I fall, I will die. I know that, but I take it because it's my own perceptions. But the idea is that if you do it without endangering people, no problem. Just do whatever you want to do. Because we are not trying to trying to become a nanny state or trying to tell you whatever you do, not bring your grandmother and say and tell you what to do. So predictable. All risks are predictable actually. Alright actually you can actually almost all risks are predictable except for some of those risks that we mentioned earlier. But all risks are predictable. That's why you need to be able to decide on or design or understand how to actually predict risk, all right? Of course, there's something called temporary risk where you think it's a simple situation, you think it's a temporary situation and you consider it's a temporary risk because, but you are not, you have not, you have not understand that there's no such thing as temporary because there's a risk there and you are taking the risk, like you're crossing the road. You know that by crossing the road, I risk being, uh, being uh, in an accident, but I do do it. Because I think is I can I can do it. So it's all it's all it's all what you got temporary in that context. Like when you when you're driving, when you're going back to your villages, you don't wear your helmet. 
and when you are, you are riding a motorbike. Why you don't wear your helmet? Because you think it's not it's not permanent, it's temporary, so you continue to float the risk. So the thing is that you always need to take calculated risk. There is risk in whatever we do, there is risk in whatever we don't do, but you need to take the risk, you need to put your put your foot forward and take the risk. And that risk is basically, and you want, you want to take that consequence based on the risk that you want to take. Right. So that's the thing. What is this? Where is this? Nuclear reactor. Yes, this is nuclear reactor. Nuclear plant. This is the Fukushima power plant. All right, Fukushima power plant in Japan. What happened? What happened to the Fukushima power plant? Temperature gone rose up and then it uh, burst. All right, so, so it's due, due to due to the tsunami that happened that day. All right, there was a tsunami. Is it a tsunami? And then there was flooding and there was the, the, the breakdown in the control. And then the, there was an overheating of the Fukushima power plant. So there was a nuclear, nuclear disaster happened. This is the very recent one, correct? So do we need nuclear power plant in Malaysia? Should we have nuclear power plant in Malaysia? No. Not for now, why? Right? We don't have a space. Japan is smaller, it's the same size as Malaysia. Yeah. Exactly the same size as Malaysia. Especially uh, from Nanjing, Malaysia, almost the same. We don't have the technology that we can Yeah, basically we can we can we can purchase the technology, alright? Of course we don't we don't we don't do nuclear power plant. Do we have a nuclear nuclear reactor in Malaysia? Small one for research. I I think we, we got in Bangi. Very good. We have one in Bangi, alright. So we have one in Bangi. It's not in UKM, but it's in Bangi. So Sitting here in, in UM is safer. That's why if you have went to UKM, <laughs> you, of course, sorry, you don't go to UK, you don't go to Bangi, you go to you go to uh, you go to Cheras. So don't 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 worry, no problem. All right, so no problem. <laughs> all right, so there's a nuclear power plant inside in Bangi itself. All right, there's a re, there's a AELB nuclear power plant, a nuclear reactor basically is is for research purposes. Do we need a nuclear power plant in Malaysia? Do we need nuclear power in Malaysia? Is that is that our maybe right now? Sorry? Maybe right now we have a safer alternative, Prof. Yes, so we have safer alternative. So our what what is our energy mix? Yes. So energy mix hydropower. Basically, basically what type, what 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 we use to to have energy. So if our safer technology and nuclear. We might not want nuclear, but this was in 2014, before the Fukushima disaster. This was the planning scenario. 2024, we're supposed to have nuclear ready. We are going nuclear. This is the scenario, 2024 here. So another three years, according to the previous plan, previous planning process, as an energy mix. The idea is as, as, as we talk about energy mix is important, okay? So energy mix is basically uh, the important thing we're talking about. I don't know why Sarawak is there, all right? Of uh, course, Sarawak, I know why Sarawak is there. You know why Sarawak is there? This is this is for, for Samananjo. We have a we have a hydropower plant in in, uh, in Sarawak that's going to be built. Remember now. So when the, the, the bakun, is it? Uh, bakun there, yes. So so when the power plant come when the power plant come into effect, basically it can actually sell power from Sarawak to Semenanjo. So that's why the bakun, that's why Sarawak is there as a uh, energy mix. So if you look at the energy mix that we have, most of them is uh, gas and the other other one is coal. So we do have hydro. Hydro is basically uh, the, the the issue with hydro. Is basically we don't have enough water to actually run hydro. All right, so there is a hydro is in Sarawak, which is a big hydro, but it still does not does not uh, create anyway. So 
So where are we going now? I'm not sure where we're going, but we have basically coal power plant, we have built more coal power plant, and also we have uh, gas power plant. Of course, coal power plant, we are using new technology. So are we going to do nuclear? I don't think so, correct? <laughs> All right. So why did you change your opinion? Because there was a, a because we don't know Fukushima. Before that, there was no Fukushima. When Fukushima came in, everybody stopped thinking. Everybody's changed their opinion. Why is that? Because there are prior knowledge that we know. So our decision, our decision is actually made at the point of time is right. You cannot go back and say, oh, why you make this decision at the point of time? At the point of time, with the information available, the decision is usually correct. And that's what happened in the Ministry of Health when they make a decision and then people dispute the decision uh, three months down the road or one month down the road or one week down the road. But at the point of time, that is the information we have. So that's the decision. So the idea of how do you communicate with people that you're making the right decision, you making have made the right decision. So is this a problem or not? EMF, is EMF a problem? This is EMF, electromagnetic field. Is it, is it going to cause cancer? Are you going to sleep around it? That, that thing that you have to think about. But let's go back, let's go back, way back into the, into the Second World War. Just after the Second World War, just look at way back. Anyone knows what's DDT? Insecticide, what kind of analysis that? All right, DDT is the organochlorine insecticide. It has been used for So it is now banned, is it? Or not being used anymore? But 1946, they used it. Powerful synthetic pesticide, harmless unless ingested, was used liberally on bull, wheels, and human alike. It's a boy. And this is a nurse. Bring on her. The hair. Because there's a lot of, these are basically people with a lot of lies coming in and they want to kill the lies and that's why they use uh, DDT. DDT is the organochlorine, it's basically harmful to human and to animal. And, but at the point of time, the decision is made. Why, the, why was the decision made at the point of time? Because the information available at the point of time is not, it's not at risk. All right. Of course, when you say, okay, we would, we would treat with caution and then we would not give. But what is the alternative? Is the, is the question. Do you have any alternative besides DDP at the point of time? If you don't have alternative, then you then you basically would not be using it. So the idea of the idea of why we make the current decision on what we are using and what we're not using is based on what information we have, and this information is carried out. So the idea of we are not practicing, we are not doing this type of uh, activities anymore is because we have new knowledge on the risk of activity. So decision, decision change. So why did we change our practice? Sorry? Yes, because we got more information. Because we know more, because we more information. And because we, but can we, can we say that we don't do it because we got no information? Can we say that we don't do it? We've got no information. Because we know it's a pesticide, we know it kills pets, but we've got no information whether it's healthy, it, is, it, it doesn't affect uh, human health or not. Or we have some information that it, 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 is not, it is not very harmful, but we don't have complete information. Do we, do we carry on with what we do or not? Can we just stop what we are doing? So there's always balance that you need to you need you need to trade and that balance is basically decided not by you alone you would as a health professional as a, a public health professional as a uh, risk uh, uh, doing, doing risk assessment you would basically inform and then based on the information you provided the decision will be made by a committee on what is the best way forward that's why it's always it's can always we can, uh, can we uh, like uh, impose more tighter rules so that uh, while while uh, gathering more information on 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 the harmful hazards uh, before I mean uh, before we make uh, changes in our policy. 
the idea the idea is if you impose more stringent regulations, stringent rules to do things, all right. Are you are you going to are you going to say that we're going to stop? The 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 enforcement of tighter control could be used uh, could be based on uh, potential harmful effects of a uh, particular agent. That's why we are. Uh... Everything is harmful. This is correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah, prof. Water is harmful, correct? So we don't drink water. Food is harmful. The more you eat, the fatter you become. The fatter you become. You get you, you get diabetes, so we don't eat food. Is it correct? Sugar is harmful. Sugar one day will become one day will basically ban sugar. So are, are we are we not are we not are we not going to, to, to use sugar? Salt is harmful. So are we going to ban salt? Are you going to die from eating salt? Are you going to die from eating sugar? Are you going to die from uh, from uh, basically exposed to some of these chemicals? Chemicals are all uh, we are not. We are not, but we are we are giving uh, warnings and precaution uh, about the use. And are, are you are you clear on your warning and prescription or not? Are you clear now when you give a warning? Are you clear that eating sugar is bad or not? You think you banning sugar alone is it good or not? No, don't no worry. This, this is this is not this is not basically yes. You can actually do you can actually impose stricter law, but by imposing stricter law, what is the what are you trying to do? Are you limiting the ability of people to business to continue? Uh, Eliminating the ability of people to live their life, eliminating of you sitting down here with me in this class. Yes, we can continue to say that okay, unless we reach 70% population, then we only go back to school. Are we going to do that or not? So why change our practice? We have more information, we change our practice for that. And we cannot stop. Just because we don't know things. If we stop because we don't know things, then then the idea is we would not be able to do anything. But we need to make a decision there and there. And that decision must be made based on the information available at that point of time. But sometimes, of course, people make decisions, even though the information is there, they make a different decision. But that's basically a, a political decision. It's, it's something different, correct? Although we know that weight is actually harmful, and nicotine in weight is, is, is a drug delivery system, but people don't think of it as a drug delivery system. Actually, weight with nicotine is a drug delivery system. So what is a drug delivery system? It's just like your syringe. It's just like your just like your anything that you give. It's a drug delivery system. You know that you know that if according to the law, you cannot actually have a syringe without a prescription. Because it's a drug, it's a drug delivery system. That means you're contravening the poison act. If you're contravening the poison act, you be you be you be caught as as distributing drug, illegally distributing drug. So it's a drug delivery system. Do we do that? Why do why didn't we do that? Although we know the risk, we know it's risk. But why didn't we do that? So the decision is. Basically, what we need to do is we need to communicate as a scientist, as an expert, communicate the decision and make sure that communication is understood and is clear. So we have qualitative risk assessment. So qualitative risk assessment is basically when we talk about qualitative. Sometimes it's different between quantitative and qualitative. Qualitative is basically based on uh, expert opinion, based on subjective evaluation. Based on looking at, looking at the frequency of exposure, the magnitude of exposure of incidents and accident event. So some of these are more of qualitative risk assessment. So there are, there are quantitative risk assessments, is what we discussed uh, that day in HRA, which is basically based on probability of an event occurring. 
and that probability that 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 information of the probability of an event occurring is basically based on previous accident record correct that we have so probability of you dying today because of a car accident is basically quite low but probably of you dying because of motorbike accident is high but probably of you dying if you are you are you are basically in a motorbike lane is low correct so there are probability and those base probability is where you where we talk about quantitative risk assessment and besides that we also use what we call exposure assessment which is called quantitative exposure assessment to have a quantitative risk assessment so what we are doing in hira has an identification risk assessment and risk control is a qualitative risk assessment although they give you a numerical estimate but the numerical estimate is a qualitative estimate. It's not a quantitative estimate. Although you think that it's quantitative, it's not quantitative. It's qualitative estimate where we give you a qualitative kind of uh, information that you can get. All right. But if you want to look at look, look, conduct a real quantitative risk assessment, you need the information about the probability of an event to occur. And that probability will give you a quantitative risk assessment. All right. So sometimes when you talk about what is what is the what is the risk of taking a vaccine and what's the risk of not taking a vaccine? These are some these are semi-quantitative because there are information available to say that if you take vaccine, this is your risk. If you don't take vaccine, this is your risk. So these are quant quantitative kind of risk assessment. But it's not based on, but also the quantitative risk assessment also does not take into account other other exposure. It's not talking about exposure, it's talking just about based on one component, which is basically vaccinated or not vaccinated. So that, that information needs to be clear. Okay, so what is the likelihood of harm or a desired event occurring? All right. The consequence of this occurrence, when it occurs, what will happen? So likelihood of something to occur, and when it occurs, what will happen? So it's risk is equal to hazard, which is the consequence, and the exposure, which is the likelihood. So the consequence of the hazard is what you need to assess. What are the hazard? That's why you do the hazard assessment, and then what are the likelihood of that hazard to of that your exposure to the hazard? What are the hazard of a nuclear power plant? What are the risks of a nuclear power plant basically exploding? All right. So all those things are there. But it does, but at the end of the day, the number doesn't matter. At the end of the day, is how you communicate the number that matter. At the end of the day, even though nuclear power plant is safe, consider consider safe and it's very safe, all right, compared to other other uh, other other plant because of not just safe because of accident per se because of the overall, overall safety profile of course you use gas there are fire issues also you use you use coal there is pollution pollution problem and the pollution basically starts from start not just not just when you're using coal start from the way the time coal is manufactured delivered transported and then go to your plant so there are the life cycle life cycle analysis of the coal that but you don't sometimes you don't take that into consideration you just take immediate thing and you decide on but so the 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 although although you have a number but people don't listen to you don't worry you just present your number i say this is the, my number you make the decision you don't ask people to ask can you make the decision it's basically we this is for the the people to accept the decision is being made if i make the decision the decision is accepted so I, basically that is the thing that you need to understand. So flowchart for higher up, right? this is classification of activities, then you do consultation, identification and hazard, risk assessment, representative control, implementation, review, identification hazard. So it is always there is a flow, a continuation, what you do, but also there's always a consultation. The, the idea of consultation is important. The yeah, idea of workers and employer consultation is important because safety and health at the at the organization level is a bipartite uh, decision. 
By pipeline means employer and employee at the organization level. It's a bipartite division. Safety and health at the country level is a tripartite division. The government, the employer, and the employee. It's a tripartite division at decision at the uh, national level. So it's why it's called always a tripartite decision when you, talk, when you want to make a decision on the safety and health of the country. That's why last week we have our Occupation Safety and Health Act being uh, read, being passed, all right, and then it would be gazetted soon. And those that that process took us, of course, it took us two years to do the process, and another three to four years to to find time in Parliament for them to read read out. So that basically took a long time, and that process actually involved a consultative process. It involved a involved what we call town hall, town hall discussion and that basically of all the key figures in that in that whole process that we come up with but the act coming up so those are the those are called tripartite decision so the same thing about your national uh, safety and health council it's also a tripartite body all right it consists of government employer and employee organization that's why it's important for you to basically be involved in your employee organization, all right, employee representative, for you to have a voice when you want to discuss about safety and health in your company. All right, safety and health in wherever you are. So involvement is good, and involvement not just because of you wanting a pole position, but involvement because you want to improve the safety and health of your where you work. So we need to classify activities according to their similarities, such as the capital area, physical area, uh, stages of production, and it should not be too big, it should not be too small, and define the task, loading, packing, mixing, and fixing a door. So these are called the work activities that we can, we can decide, and we can discuss, and we can basically uh, build, and then we can, by doing that, we'll be able to con conduct a hazard identification risk assessment for, for that purposes. So what is hazard? Hazard is basically anything that can cause harm. All right. So hazard, anything is a hazard. Anything is the potential to cause harm is called a hazard. So what's a hazard? Hazard is a source of potential harm. So can be, it can be a health hazard. That means it can cause harm leading to the deterioration of your health. Sugar is a hazard, is it? Is it a hazard? Is sugar a hazard? But you still consume sugar. Sugar is a health hazard. But you continue to consume sugar. Why? Salt is a hazard. But you still continue to consume salt. Why? Because there is always a level that you can tolerate and that is you decide you decide the community decide just like what we discussed earlier about ddt it is not is it currently if you do the same thing there will be a lot of reward reward correct people would they will protest but you do it at that point of time people just follow because at the end of the day you're not you're not doing something to harm people correct you just do something to protect people. The problem is that doing something to protect people, you don't know you don't know the harm of what you're doing. That's all. All right. So it's a different thing. You're not doing something from the context of you want to harm someone. You're doing the context of you want to protect someone. But is it is it true that you want to protect someone? Or you to protect the people who is who basically you discriminate? It's also some type of discrimination. Correct. So there's safety hazard. Safety hazard is very easy because safety hazard you can see, and once this, once something you can see is something you can communicate more easily. That's why it's very difficult for you to communicate something that you can't see, can't hold, all right? Just like your RNA vaccine, can't see, can't hold, and you 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 your view have taken vaccine, all right? Some of you take Pfizer, some of you think that Pfizer because of the RNA component you go and take. Non, you got the other non-RNA vaccine. Right. So that is the thing. 
So there's also environmental hazards. Environmental hazards are hazards that basically cause degradation of the environment. And that degradation of the environment would basically continue to can cause health hazards also. So there's not just environmental itself, but environmental causing health hazards also is there. So there is the context of what other potential harm. Potential harm, you can you must look at it from the all the perspective of what activity you're doing, whether you are you harming the your own health, your safety, or your environment. Same thing like what a lot of people are doing. A lot of people are going camping. Remember, last two, three to four weeks, a lot of people are going camping because everybody is 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 uh, we allow travel and there's no nothing, no no not many places to go, so everybody go camping. And they did not understand what is the environmental degradation that they do that they cause to the when they when they involve in certain activities. Okay, so type of hazard, simple, we have biological hazard, we have chemical hazard, we have physical hazard, mechanical or ergonomic hazard, and psychosocial hazard. This is where we can divide the hazard into, into five components. Why we divide into five components is that when we look, when we go to a work site, when we go to a workplace, when we try and assess a hazard itself, we must look at it. Okay, is that biological hazard or not? But of course, before this, we don't care about biological hazard because we don't care about, about uh, because we, are, we, have, we have treatment to treat everything. So if you get flu today, you still come to, you still come to class because I know that my flu, if I give it to you, you also can go and you so you also can uh, take the uh, that, take medication and get better. But you don't know that by doing that, you actually you are you are decreasing my you are increasing my disability, you are decreasing you are, you are influencing my uh, disability adjusted life. You are influencing my darling. By you coming in with the flu and you infecting me, you are basically influencing my darling. So biological hazard is there, chemical hazard is there, is there chemical in this room? There are chemicals, but what type of chemical are you are you referring to? There are chemicals, the chair, actually, the new chair with the chemical, we have new paint. We just painted this this wall. If you come in, if you come in uh, uh, that day, you, that you, you do smell some chemical, all right? So there are chemical hazards. Is that physical hazard or not? Lighting, is it a hazard? Radiation, is it a hazard? Is that radiation or not? Is that mechanical hazard or ergonomic hazard? Is your chair basically correct or not? You're sitting correctly or not? And is that psycho, psycho, psychosocial hazard or not? Are we, are we not giving you enough time to actually process this information? Are we giving you too much work that you cannot have no time to actually think and process the information or not? So all those things comes into a whole thing. All right. Of course, some of you are working, working and those working people have different, uh, different, uh, what we call that, different profile. But the idea is this course is not designed, it's designed for everybody. So we cannot just pick anybody and pick everybody. So this is the thing. So what is, what is exposure? Exposure basically we focus on type of contact with the substance, how long you're exposed to the substance is called exposure, and how much you're exposed to the substance is called exposure. So exposure takes into two, two considerations. The, concentration of the substance and also the time of exposure. So there's always the concentration of the substance and also the frequency of you exposed to that concentration of the substance. Right. So that, that, is, that, is, that is important. That's why you have a, when you talk about which assessment for COVID-19, you have a 15 minutes and one meter. Because the one meter, the one meter is basically considered as a, the risk of the concentration of that at that point of time, one meter. But of course, we don't take into we should take into account the environmental situation, whether you are in a small room or a big room, whether you take off your mask or don't take off your mask. Right. So those things also comes into consideration. Also, we go look at it whether your city value, correct. So if your city value is thirty, most probably you are not being effective. But if your city value is more less than twenty then you become more effective. So all those are concentration of the substance. But it has a time that, right? 15 minutes. Why 15 minutes? Why not 20 minutes? Why not 5 minutes? Why not 30 minutes? Why 15 minutes? Where do we pick the number from? Why 15 minutes? Why 1 meter? Why not 2 meter?
The size of the air airborne droplet. The size of the airborne droplet. Okay, maybe. Why 15 minutes? Why one meter? Two meter? Why not? Why not two meter? Why not one meter? And this 15 minutes and this 15 minutes, 15 minutes, one meter, two meter. Is it based on wearing mask or not wearing mask? Unprotected or protected exposure? We don't know, correct? At the end, we don't know. Uh, the decision was made based on practicability, based on information. Of course, one, one, of, the, one, of, the, one of the decisions was because we thought it was droplet. So droplet, we can, between, it's between, you can say it can travel between one to two meters. But that decision also was made based on, you are not protected. All right, so 15 minutes, one meter of un unprotected contact. But if a protected contact, then it might be different. But because the communication actually have been have been uh, very very uh, lost lost in the in the idea of the communication. And for me, for us who who understand what is it to inform people again, it would be would not be basically very be difficult because they have actually have a preconception already. All right, preconception because the conception has been there and we have basically uh, what we call enforced that information into them continuously, continuously. So that's why continuous, continuous reinforcement. When you have continuous reinforcement of information, then the people actually would be, would not, you cannot change their, their, their concept anymore because they are thinking that. So it, it's good and it's, uh, it's bad. So you must, you must think, you must, you must remember that. So health risk assessment is all process of uh, estimated magnitude of risk of to health. All right. At the end, is, is it at the end you decide whether it's tolerable or acceptable to you? What do you want to do? You want to come to class or don't come to class? So you have a risk and benefit at the end of the at, at, at the at, at the at the very end. And why do we ask you to wear masks when you come to class? Why do some people wear double masks? Well, there's actually no effect on double masking. It basically causes more harm sometimes of double masking. Why do you wear double masks? And what mask do you choose? Why do you wear N95 when there's no risk of aerosol aerosolization in this in this context? Why why you why you have why each person have different perception because each person have different level of acceptance, different level of tolerability toler tolerating. And do you dispute that? You tell them you cannot wear double mask? No. Basically what we what we want is minimum that we want to do. That, okay, you must at least wear a mask. And we know what the mask is used for. We know that long, long time ago. We know that from the day one, day, I know that from the day one when the when the disease happened, the mask is not to protect me. It's to protect you against me. It's never to protect me. But if everybody wear mask, it protects everybody is protected. I am sick. When I talk, the, the, the organism will stick on my mask, and that's why the mask is designed, especially surgical mask, it's designed in a manner that actually it protects me. So if everybody is wearing the correct mask, you don't have to wear double mask. You don't have to wear uh, N95 because we are not doing, we are not doing an aerosolizing procedure currently. And I'm just talking to you. Although when I talk to you, I aerosolize, but even how fast I shall also, the organism is basically contained within this, this mask itself. Because the mask has three layers, all right? The first layer is basically to absorb all the liquid. So when you have all the liquid absorbed, any organism can stick on the liquid much more. So the idea is that if you wear more, you get more protection enough. No, but it's okay because some people think that they, they accept what they want and they, they tolerate what, what they need, correct? But by wearing this mask since the first day of the, of the outbreak, so the first day of COVID, 
we have mentioned already, if you are sick, you wear a mask. But because we know that there is a problem of no asymptomatic carrier, that's why we say everybody wear a mask. When at the beginning, we don't know there's asymptomatic carrier. We know, but we don't know that's so big. Now we know that 85% of people are asymptomatic carrier, so we ask people to wear a mask. So the idea is, what is your emotion? What is your concern and what is your decision? Send your children to school or not? Send your children to school if they're fully vaccinated, send or not? What you want to allow them to do in school? Should school reopen or not? Should school not reopen? There's always some debate. There's always issue of what is what is good and what is bad, correct? When should school open? When should school not open? School open also wrong, school not open also wrong, correct? <laughs> So everybody, everybody is wrong because the decision, the communication is not clear. The, the, the decision on the communication is not clear. The role of school also is not clear. Why do you need to go back to school? What are you going to learn? What are you going to learn when you go to split the class into three? What are you going to learn? What is the role of school? What's the role of going to school? Why you go to school? Why you send your kid to school? Why you go to school? Why I went to school? Why you went to school? What you what you did in school? To educate, to educate. No, I think I go to school because I want to see my friend. <laughs> I go to school because every day I can talk to my friend. After that, I can go. I can go uh, to canteen during the break time. I can makan. I can use my money. I can spend my money. The little money that my my, my parents give to me. I can spend my time with my friend and we learn to communicate. We learn to live with each other. Do we learn anything in school? Yes, we do. All right. But is it to educate only? To socialize. Yeah, so when you talk about socialization, when you split the class into three, what's the, what's the, what socialization is? Where is there socialization? Where is there, where is there, where is there, where is there the content of I? Basically, what you need to do is to go to school, correct? The risk is there, correct? But the risk is lower compared to previously, correct? Previously, we're not vaccinated, now we're 90% vaccinated. Our children also are vaccinated. Go to school, everybody go to school, go to class, teach them what you need to do, ensure that the ventilation is good. How do you ensure good ventilation? Open the window, we go back to the normal school. I don't know what school you come from, but I know what school I, I, I come from. I came from I came from Sekolah Rendah Kebangsaan, Sekolah Menengah Kebangsaan. Open windows. Where you got closed windows? All of those are lowers and it's all open, fan, no aircon. I got no aircon, open windows. And I did not I did not die. So right, I'm here. Teaching you as a professor, I did not die, correct? I did not suffer, I suffer, la, but I did not die. <laughs> Alright. So, why can't our children do that? Why you need to be so protective of our children? You must air corner, after they'll suffer, la, after they'll be sweating, la, they cannot study, if they're sweating. La. Yes, I cannot study, I'm sweating, but I'm still, I, I, I'm still your professor today, correct? So, the idea, the, the idea is what? What you want, what you want, you know, it's not what the, what. So you must decide, you must communicate properly what you want. So what is correct? So we know we know this already, we're correct. We know how it spread, of course, by droplet and aerosol, all right. And we know eighty-five percent is asymptomatic. We know this. When how when do we know this? Two thousand twenty. Much the time we know this And has it changed? No. It's the same thing. <laughs> have not changed, nothing has changed. So we know this, we know how it spread, we know that currently the risk is lower because we have. That's why the risk actually changes. You cannot have the same perception, same issue, risk changes. And I did advise that yes, open the school. Why you open the school is not for teaching per se. It's not for not for me telling you what to do. 
it's more for communication and interaction and get to get the idea of how to how to learn from people right? so when no now okay let's focus so we just so we finish the finish the uh, storytelling finish the information finish the everything now let's go back to go back to the real world so when to when you conduct risk assessment basically you conduct risk assessment when there is a risk that you want to you want to you want to decide correct like COVID-19, we conduct risk assessment because we want to do risk. And of course, currently we do, we do risk assessment every time when you basically you're exposed to a, to a COVID patient, we do risk assessment all the time. All right, we have uh, automatic risk assessment that we, we have in, in the University of Malaya Medical Center, which we develop with the algorithm and they can they risk you for high risk, low risk and, and moderate risk all right, based, on the, based on the information that you provided. And that is where we use that information to make like, our decision on whether to quarantine you or not to quarantine you, all right? So the decision is making. So it's a risk assessment is a decision making tool. Risk, ass risk assessment itself is not useless without the the without using it for decision making. You need to be able to use your the, the information you get from your risk assessment to 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 make you decide what you want to do, and that is what you do every day. Subconsciously, you do it every day. Because I do it every day. Do I want to come and teach you all today or not? What do I get from teaching you all? So when do you do? If there's a new process, chemical introduced in the workplace, suspicion of potential new health hazard, EMF radiation or COVID-19, increase the incidence of certain diseases or accident. So you have a statistic. That's why you need to collect the statistic and then you have more information. We know that currently our, our diabetes is going higher People with diabetes are getting getting uh, sicker, things like that. So we need to do a risk assessment to identify how do we reduce the number of diabetes. Environmental disaster like the Fukushima disaster and review of existing health center. So that's why we do need to do risk assessment. So what's risk assessment? Risk assessment is basically a scientific framework override to make for you to do decision making. At the end, at the, at the end, it's about decision making. And decision making on the safety, health, and environmental issue, whether 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 it's health issue, safety issue, or an environmental issue, you make to make the decision whether to actually have uh, something you want something or you don't want something. Okay, again, is it tolerable or acceptable? At the end, is is always this always this component because a lot of the time people people say that okay, we want zero risk. Cannot there's no such thing as zero risk. At the end of the time, it's just at, at, the, at this point of time, what you want to do. And you want to do it because you want to make sure that your services, your services continue. That's why we are able to, our, we are able to, we are able to this, have our service in UMMC continue without problem because we have discussed this part of it. And this decision is very, very difficult to make. It's not made by me. I get I get the information, I say to do this, but other people say don't do this. I say, okay, doesn't matter. Whatever you decide, we will do, and that is the decision you're going to make. And there's a consequence if you think that there's something wrong, there's a consequence for follow. But you must understand there's a minimum decision that we make, and it will be based on the minimum decision. Just like what we are what our decision today is for you to come in, you must be vaccinated, you must you must wear masks, correct? And what type of mask? At least a surgical mask. You have to wear double mask, triple mask, you have to wear uh, energy device, it's up to you. So you basically, when you always ask three questions, what can happen that is uh, not required to happen? All right. Is that, is that such a thing? Okay. And then you ask, what are the consequences if that thing happened? Is it acceptable? You ask, is that a satisfactory control measure or protection steps that I can make to actually make the, make the thing acceptable? All right, so COVID-19 happened. All right, do we say that, okay, we don't go out until COVID-19 go away? No, we still need, need to live. So is that consequence or not? Yes, people die because of COVID-19. But can we actually make the, make, make the uh, risk actually reduce the risk or not? Yes, we can, and we're doing it. And that's why we are here today. So you decide. The, the, the idea of the day is you decide what you want to do. You decide, not to say you as a you, you as your company decide, your group decide, 
your 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 who not it, it wouldn't it wouldn't be just the one who actually do the risk assessment design, but the one who actually use the risk assessment design, the one who actually uh, are, are working in that in that area design. That's why you need a representation from employer and employee. Although you are giving, you are not, you are, you, if you, you are there as a consultant, you're not giving, you're not providing the decision. You're just providing the information for the decision to be made. All right, so here's the identification. So a study on hazard or safety study on the area, what has available, what are safety precautions. So you need to look at what are actually being currently being practiced and how basically those things actually change. The study is, is qualitative in nature. Basically, you ask questions. The result of this from this will be, be revealed areas for further consideration. So you do a qualitative study as an identification. Once you've done that, you can actually do a quantitative study, quantitative assessment, not quantitative study, quantitative assessment to assess the risk of exposure quantitatively. So quantitative assessment basically is, is, is usually we don't talk about hygiene assessment. Hygiene is not cleanliness. Hygiene is basically uh, industrial hygiene. It's, it's looking at it from industrial cleanliness and industrial cleanliness is talking about measurement of chemical or substances in the in, in the in the in the what? Then what consequence effect of this acceptable? So we need to conduct a consequence analysis. So qualitative consideration and other times using quantitative method as we discussed earlier. Method of quantitative method. If you want to learn quantitative method, you want to learn how to do it, then you need to go to the HRA class. The HRA class, we did discuss about some quantitative method. Of course, we decided to discuss it briefly because each of the quantitative methods that we discussed in HRA is actually one class itself. Right? One lesson, one, one, two credit class itself. Of course, consequence analysis has two applications. And to allow assessment of acceptable of the consequence to identify as the foundation for plan of emergency, emergency procedure also. So you must understand when you do a risk assessment, you have to look at emergency procedure. What you can what you do during an emergency and whether whether how you actually evacuate or egress during an emergency. Alright, so why do risk assessment? Assess the characteristics of potential risk based posed by existing audio hazard, provide basis of valid decision control measure. Formulate update occupational health standard, communicate potential health hazard and policy, minimize future health risk and cost. So that's what we did, and that's why why we are still here today. Where's the hazard? So we need to recognize where's the hazard. So how do we do hazard identification? The basic minimum thing that basically we, we ask you all to do is do a walkthrough survey. And although, although people think it's walk through survey is basically but walk through survey is is you just go and go and go for a tour. Yes, you go for a tour, but go for a tour with an eye of identifying and recognizing the hazard. And that eye itself, basically, you need prior prior information. You need to know before you really can see. So the eye only can see what they know. The eye cannot see what they don't know. By looking at here, I can I identify issue, I can tell you what's the issue, I can I can see what's the issue. But view sitting down there, you wouldn't be able to identify the issue because you have not done the, you don't know the problem. So that's why you need to do a walkthrough survey. Of course, when you do a walkthrough survey, it's a step you need to do a walkthrough survey. It's not, it's not, it's just basically for you to understand that you cannot just go and do it together. You must need to, you must need to meet the management, discuss the purpose of exercise, review the health complaint, look at the process flow. Before you then, then make sure you have a walkthrough survey form before you actually go for walkthrough survey. Right. So there are steps that there are steps that you need to do before you actually go for walkthrough survey, which is basically meet the management, discuss the purpose of exercise, review health complaints or health data, process flow in, in hand, look at the process flow, and then go to walkthrough survey form. So observation make during walkthrough survey, observe all handling procedure. Observe location of all employees relative to potential source of exposure. What are the control measures available? Uh, what, whether personal protective equipment is used or not. Whether they use it correctly or not. Whether whether there's effective engineering control or not. Whether inspect active production final product and its packaging. Follow the pathway of the waste man, waste material and determine the disposal site because there are problem waste also there is hazard. Number of employees for each section, all right, the agenda, age, and ethnicity. 
observe obvious clinical signs and such as skin dryness. So when you go and see, see, you can see the skin dryness, you can see the uh, uh, dermatitis or things like that, you can see, all right? And then you ask questions and then you get information. And of course, discuss work practice with the personnel directly. So you ask questions and ask and see whether, whether they understand or not. So that's the process. So you have an SOP in hand, send an operating procedure in hand, what they're supposed to do. Then you go down and you ask them, are you doing this? Then you, then you understand what went wrong and how to improve the situation. Hazard rating? I think this is this one we discussed the day. So hazard rating, you can rate it you know, any way you want, but we use it using the five five things. We basically look at it from the perspective of whether it's caused death, open or disability, major, minor, or slight. Of course, you can have other kind of hazard rating based on probability of event, based on probability of consequences, or based on consequences of the event using the hazard rating. But so these are based on consequences, but very rough consequences of the event. Then, what is exposure? So, exposure is basically look at can look at from two perspectives: look at from concentration or look at from frequency of exposure. Correct. Or how much substance you're exposed to, and then frequency of exposure. Then you can have a magnitude of exposure. This, uh, this, this is what this is, we only use it. We are only discussing frequency rating. So frequency rating is basically looking at the probable, report, occasional, probable, or, or frequent. All right, these are some of the hazard limits that is there, just, just to show you. Different hazard and different limit. Different term of the limit, we call it the permissible exposure limit or uh, PL. And usually, is, is when you talk about PL, it is measured in eight hour, eight hour TWA time weighted average. So you can use ergonomic assessment to assess ergonomic ergonomic condition. You can use rapid upper limb assessment, rapid entire body assessment, Dyer's equation, or Rogers muscle fatigue analysis. You can use that to actually analyze your uh, rapid data set. But this, this, this information is available. It's available and then there is information for you. But we are not going to discuss this in detail. All right, just going to tell you that uh, what is there. There is something that you can use. Then with that, there is a, there is also a risk risk categorization. So all these things basically have risk categorization. It's just to show you that each of the instrument you use to measure, to assess exposure, you need to have a that is usually a categorization, and that is basically where you categorize the risk to different levels, the levels of risk. So that is just to inform you that is there. Okay? And of course, REBA and RULA have different categorization. It doesn't matter one to five, one to eleven, or one to one to seven, but you must define that. You must in your information you must provide that that you are using that. Okay. So evaluation and exposure hazard substance monitoring, personal monitoring. So this is basically when you find a hazard, you want to evaluate whether there is exposure or not. You can do what you call hygiene monitoring or environmental monitoring. So environmental monitoring, you can do it personal monitoring. That means you monitor how much the person exposed to the chemical over the TWA eight hour by, by, by putting the equipment on the person itself for eight hours. You can use personal personal monitoring or positional or area monitoring where you look at when you put the equipment in the area to monitor the chemical or the exposure in the area itself. And of course, there's a biological monitoring. There's two types of biological monitoring. Biological monitoring means that anything you monitor, biological fluid, you take biological fluid and you see whether there's exposure. Or not. So there's the biological monitoring looking at exposure, whether you're exposed to the chemical or not. How you look, how you look at exposure to the chemical it depends on the uh, toxicokinetics of the chemical, which you want to learn in the HRA. And you, you, you're also looking at whether whether that what's the effect of exposure to chemical. So that's called biological effect monitoring. So biological monitoring, look at exposure itself, whether you're exposed to chemical or not, and whether what's the effect of the chemical during exposure. So that's called biological effect monitoring. Right? These are some of the some of the things that you can use for biological monitoring and what some of the things that you can use for biological uh, for different kind of monitoring. Urine, expired air, blood, expired air. So we're talking about biological monitoring. You, 
can do it as a medical surveillance procedure or you can do it as an exposure assessment procedure. So you must understand that. Biological monitoring can be done as a medical surveillance procedure where you as a doctor would survey what this chemical is exposed. But also you can do it as a exposure monitoring procedure in the context of you're doing environmental monitoring and then you can do also exposure monitoring of the person itself using a biological monitoring. For instance, let's say you focus on benzene. What is benzene? Benzene is basically a hydrocarbon. It's an aromatic hydrocarbon. It's the basic, basic benzene ring, basic, basic, hydrocarbon, basic uh, aromatic ring, and then it's six carbon. It's a basic building block of uh, your petroleum. All right, it's, it's a basic building block. And it's present in petroleum itself. So there are people actually who deliver petroleum, drive a truck, petroleum truck. So when they monitor, they monitor environmental monitoring. So it's very difficult for you to monitor environmental monitoring or even personal monitoring for a person who is driving trucks. Because there is a lot of other factors that is involved. There's wind factor, there's, uh, there's, there's, there's factor inside, inside, the, inside the car, the factor when they are moving, things like that. So there's a lot, it's not a, it's not a controlled environment. But you do measure it and you and you get it, get the information on either personal monitoring or environmental monitoring of the chemical in the environment. But that person can still be exposed. And what can you do? You can actually monitor the urine to look at benzene metabolite, like as mercopic acid in, in urine, which is this one, this one of the benzene metabolite. You can measure that, and basically from that itself, you can know whether the person is exposed or not and whether your environmental monitoring is correct. All right, so that's why it's called exposure monitoring. Using biological monitoring as a form of exposure monitoring, especially for chemicals, volatile organic compound chemicals, that is, that have basically a biological uh, level that you can get, all right, for eight-hour exposure. So measuring, where to sample, who to sample, how many samples to take, how long to sample, and how many samples, how many samples to take, when to, when to sample, that means what time you want to do sampling, and selection of monitoring equipment. So where to sample, so personal monitor preferred method to determine the personal exposure. So you want to, you want to look at TWA, it's usually air samples collected within the breathing zone of the workers, representing the air inhaled by the workers, and usually 20 to 36 centimeters from the nostril. If you look at this picture, the person actually is handling Handling a petroleum product, exposure to chlor uh, exposure to mercury, because our petroleum product contains mercury. Right. Mercury is part of contamination. Actually, mercury is contamination. Mercury is present in, in, in the crust, everything. So mercury is, uh, is a contaminant. And when you extract extract petroleum product, you basically you basically you contain, there is mercury inside the petroleum product. So basically, they want to measure the amount of mercury there, and for that. <laughs> Basically, they're exposed to both benzene and also mercury. So, what, 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 basically, to, we are measuring mercury. So, we have uh, two devices here. All right, so, we have a, we have a, a batch here. All right, we basically, a batch to, me to measure the, the level. And we have another one, another uh, charcoal tube here. We we'll actually collect with, with a pump at the bottom. We we'll actually pump and collect the air. So there's two measurements. A batch basically is a static, uh, non, not active measurement. A, a, a charcoal tube with a pump, you can actually tune the thing to make it to make it look like your breathing time. So those are the those are those are just to tell you that you've got to make it within the within the breathing zone. This will explain more in HRA if you if you're interested. So area sampling, position sampling used for asset of inspective control measure. Locate high concentration point of the workplace so that you can you can either do a control measure or put a warning sign. Locate flammable explosive point again okay, to put a warning sign to put a no smoking sign. Undertake continuous monitoring as required right, in a confined space. If you're looking at a confined space, then you do a continuous monitoring. So the, the, the definition of confined space here is different from the term confined space that we've been using for the last two years, right? So you must understand that a definition of confined space in, in, uh, in uh, occupational safety and health context is different from the confined space that, that uh, our health minister has been has been helping for the last uh, uh, 
two years. That's a different, different concept. A confined space is a specific area that is defined under the law. It's called confined space. So usually we don't we don't we don't use the word confined space itself, all right? But we use area, confined area, so that so that it differentiate between that, that. But at the end of the day, confined spaces are very very well defined. It have to have limited entry, uh, and also it have to have the yeah, there's no natural ventilation within within a confined space. So as we look as we discuss it now, there's active sampling and passive sampling. The collection which you, you see just now, one of it is active sampling. Basically, they, and there is a pump there. So the pump is basically tuned to to mimic your breathing. All right, how 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 much you breathe? So what is what is your what is your breathing rate depends on how fast you breathe, how much air you breathe. What does it depend on? Your activity, correct. So you must tune it based on your activity. So normally, how much you breathe per minute, but still need 5 liters per minute, 7 liters per minute. Let's say you're doing different activity, you can go up to 10 liters per minute. So that's why the activity changes, activity different, so that you, you tune it in the waveform of the activity itself. So passive sampling, passive sampling is where we talk about a diffusion batch like a benzene in the outside. Any questions? All right, so these are some of the measure, measurements, some of the equipment that can be measured. So you can measure anything from temp from temperature, from uh, humidity, from uh, wind speed, hydrometer, uh, humidity also, from sound, sound, anemometer, humidity, pressure and temperature, IQ, dust track, light, accelerometer, radiation, all those things you can measure. So that's different, 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 different measurement there that you can use. Then you have a develop a risk mitigation and management plan. So with all this information collected, you need to develop a risk mitigation and management plan, which consists of so the first thing is can the hazard be eliminated? Then can the consequence be eliminated? Can the effect or the consequence be reduced? Does the risk satisfy agreed criteria? All right, so if not, then you modify. So you go back this, you follow this process over and over again until you are the risk become acceptable. So can the hazard be eliminated? Can we remove the hazard itself? Can we remove COVID? No, we cannot remove COVID. We can, we want to try, but we cannot. Right? Can, we, can the consequence be eliminated? Can the consequence of COVID be eliminated? Uh, maybe. Can the consequence be reduced? Yes, I think it can be reduced, not eliminated. So, it's, so at the end, is the, is the risk, uh, does the risk satisfy the degree criteria? Now? So if it's acceptable, then we just stop there and we don't go back until we get another new information. If not, if, if, if you continually do this without, without going through, without stopping, then you actually cannot function, you cannot, your, your business cannot, cannot start. But some, some people, are uh, very difficult and some people actually have this crazy this problem. So you have a risk metric, so you have exposure rating and hazard rating, and you have a numerical risk metric, correct? Then you put this in the numerical, you can basically look at it from you can define as low risk, high risk, and and uh, low risk, middle, and high risk. So let's say you have substance A, B, C, and D. So you put the substance A, B, C, and D in this risk matrix, and you okay, this substance A is low risk, substance B is moderate risk. Substance C and D is high risk. But the idea is how do you reduce the risk of the substance? You can move upward or to the left. So you can move either upward or to the left. So can you reduce the hazard or not? Yes or no? Yes, then stop. If you cannot reduce hazard, can I reduce exposure? And which one should we start? Of course, we should start with the higher risk, B and C. So can you reduce the hazard or can you reduce exposure? So which is easier, reduce exposure or reduce the hazard? So all those things you need to take into consideration. This matrix basically is not just to put the hazard inside this matrix, but also to be able to visually look at the look at the information and see what you want to do with the information. Not just put the number, put the put the put the hazard into, into the matrix, but 
All right, if I have a chemical chemical D, what can I do? Can I reduce it? Can I change it? First of all, we change it then to three, then become moderate. All right, or I reduce the exposure. All this, all this are simple way of looking at it from risk metric perspective, risk management, and also risk communication. So you communicate the risk. It's easier for you to communicate the risk. So you get a numerical risk estimate. Which we, which we produce, right, 1 to 25, and this is going to give you a communication tool that you can decide what you want to do first, and also you can decide what are considered, you can, you can classify it as low risk, moderate risk, and high risk. So classification based on the numerical estimate. All right, so then you basically, you can communicate effectively with the senior management, actively involved for each individual in the workplace, Effective communication through consultation. That's what we, we always discuss: consultative purposes, provision of appropriate information, education, and training. So this is everything we did. This is everything we do for COVID. This is everything we do. Okay, all these things have been done. That's why we were able to we were able to uh, come up of the of the situation much better than we went in the situation. So the, the idea is we manage or transfer risk. What the meaning? What do you mean by manage or transfer risk? It's like the, the thing is the thing is it's so classical currently in, in, in COVID. You know what happened now in COVID? People are kept in ED for a prolonged period of time. Why? Because they don't have PCR test. They don't have uh, uh, RTK test. I want to wait for PCR test. Why do you want to wait for PCR test? Because I want to know whether it's COVID positive. Why do you want to know whether it's COVID positive or not? Because I want to know, I want to know uh, what I should do. Why do you need to know whether it's COVID positive or not? Why? Is it, is it to decide which one you want to go? Or to this, to make sure that you don't get you don't get don't get infected. Is it who is it for? Is it for patient or is it for is it for healthcare worker? Is it for patient? You do it for medical healthcare staff. For patient. But if I am positive negative today, tomorrow can I be positive enough? So what's the point? What's the point? Like comfort. comfort. to who? Comfort to the healthcare provider. To provide comfort to the healthcare provider. So what are you doing? <laughs> are you actually we are actually we are the risk. No, you're not reducing the risk. You're not reducing the risk. You're not reducing the risk. You're just transferring the risk only. You transfer the risk to the ED people. ED people will take the risk. I as a cardiologist, I don't want to take the risk. I, in the surgical world, I don't want to take the risk. I'm transferring the risk to the ED people. The ED people will take the risk. I'll keep all my patients in ED until I get the result. It's not transferring risk. All right? So the idea is, do you manage the risk or you transfer the risk? You transfer the risk. You don't want to take the risk. You make it, you transfer the risk to other people and you let other people take the risk. Of course, that's wrong. We know there's no risk, don't worry. We know that it, the risk of someone who is basically, there's no such thing as zero risk. We started off with the, the discussion this morning. And that means that it doesn't matter what you do, tomorrow the person might be positive. What you do today. And that is the information you need to, need to be clear. If you can manage the risk in your ward, then you manage it. And if there is four people in the cubicle and the four people get positive because of one patient, it's acceptable. And you must, you must understand that. You cannot make the risk zero and you must communicate that. But a lot of our clinicians, a lot of our, especially our clinician friends, they don't understand that and they continue to think that there is zero risk. They continue to think that patient 
I have no risk. Once patient comes into the hospital, there is a risk of not so common infection. There is a risk. You can reduce the risk, but there is a risk. You can do everything, but there's a risk. But you cannot stop. You cannot just transfer the risk. That's what a lot of clinicians are doing. They're trying to transfer the risk. It's not my risk. Let's put it in another ward. Let's put it in this ward first until, until the follow is negative. Without understanding that there's no such thing. There's no such thing as zero risk. It's something you need to understand. You need to learn how to manage the risk. What transfer the risk? A lot of the things, even in the whole wide world, Australia is exporting uh, waste to Malaysia. This is correct. They're transferring waste to Malaysia. Australia is exporting. Uh, don't don't process their yeah, don't process the 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 waste. The waste. The waste. Not just industrial waste. They are they are they are what is called linex. The mineral. All right. They don't process all the mineral. They send to Malaysia to process. They are transferring the waste. Because it's more expensive to do it there because of the risk precaution that they have to take. And then they transfer it here. The risk precaution is supposed to be cheaper to manage. All right. So that's why it's called transfer. You transfer the risk instead of managing it, you're transferring it by you, you're managing it by transferring it. Right. So that, that's the thing you need. You can think about it. Like. So what's the difference between occupation environmental and occupation health risk? Right, so occupational risk is basically you talking about eight hour exposure, forty hours a week, and it's basically voluntary exposure. You voluntarily go to work, although sometimes I've been saying involuntary, but you still voluntarily go to work. So basically, it's a voluntary exposure. And environmental risk is involuntary risk, where you are you are there, you are you cannot you cannot change your environment. People say, oh, you can you can move to a better and better environment, or you can you can buy a big bigger house to move away from your from your PPIP house. If you give me a bigger house, I will go lah. But with that kind of money, if I don't have that kind of money, correct. So so the idea is the environmental health risk you need to consider everybody, you need to consider the issue of the person is not exposed, you need to consider the vulnerable population. Because you see the occupational health risk, there's no vulnerable population. Because you are basically has been screened, has been com completely different. Prof, so I have a I, question. Hello. Hey, what is it not coming up? Yeah, yes, you come up. Yes. Hi. Oh, you're there. You're not here. Okay, good. 